I'd like to share our mission and vision statement with you. And our mission statement is to better people's lives and to be a force for good in the world. And our vision statement is to create a world that works better for everyone through the principles and practices of functional nutrition. A more just, peaceful, and sustainable world through the biological transformation of humanity. We are absolutely delighted to have you all here this morning, and um, I am going to hand the Zoom over to our son, Brian Mariani, now, and he will host. Thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry for the little swap here. We're having some uh, internet troubles, but we'll make do. That's what we're doing, right? We're doing it together. So welcome, everybody. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so this morning, we are really very lucky. We have uh, Catherine Taylor with us, who's going to be our featured presenter. And Catherine is a very, a very dear friend, uh, first and foremost, uh, but she's also an absolutely fantastic practitioner in the world today. And she is the author of the best-selling Inner Child Workbook. Uh, she's been practicing professionally for over four years. And she has um, a very comprehensive protocol that she uses that really combines inner child work with uh, EFT, EFT tapping. And she really puts everything together into this absolutely incredible um, healing that she offers to the world. Um, so I'm very, very excited to have her with us today. With everything going on, um, I know that this will be a very powerful um, time for all of us to be connected, especially with someone like Catherine. So I know she'll go into some more details around exactly what she does, um, but I'm just delighted to have you here, Catherine, and I'm going to sit back and enjoy as I'm sure the rest of us will. So I'll pass it over to you, Catherine. The floor is yours. All right. I want to start the recording. Oh. I don't know if I can live up to all of that today because more than anything, <clears throat> I'm not coming to you today as much of, as a practitioner as I am someone that is just um, trying to deal with what's before us and the, the multiple shades of that. Uh, for me, as a 72-year-old white woman that was in California during the 70s and the ERA movement, which I've been watching the Netflix program on that. And so before this even erupted, I was kind of revisiting that set of feelings that I had at that time. And even watching that Netflix was bringing discomfort because I just remembered the the angst of trying to fight for those rights and and the Phyllis Schaffley, Phyllis Schaffley group that was just you know trying to oppress it at every end and so that in no way uh even touches what we're seeing today and yet it's the other side of this long continuum that uh this planet and this country and we as human beings have to share and have to figure this out. And the reason I call this the shades of grief is because we each have our own perspective and we each have our own response to this. And that very response is what tells us where we are on that continuum and what our work is, not only collectively, but personally. And there's been a lot, I think, that has become very apparent to me uh, in this last two weeks. And part of it is my own denial of, of how uh, prevalent racism is. It's not that I didn't know it, but it's not in my face every day. It's just not. 
and I've had several really eye-opening and heart expanding experiences. And one was with a client where I, and a client of color, and I asked her what this had brought up for her. And she said, nothing, nothing new. And it was, it was so profound to me that so many of us are reeling with the horror of that video of what we saw and how black people have lived with that as part of their reality. And it really brought it home to me of how we have to come out of that first stage of grief, which is denial and that complacency and how easy it is if it's not in our face to just kind of almost spiritually bypass it if we're on a spiritual uh, journey, uh, how easy it is to not have our attention there and how easy it is to feel powerless if we do put our, put our attention there. And it's time. I, I read a lot and heard a lot about white privilege this, this week. And it's, it's not a comfortable topic, but it's a necessary one that those of us who are white really have to start moving through that discomfort so we can find our place of action and move through that discomfort so we don't come in with the answers. We don't have the answers. The biggest gift we can give right now is to listen and to admit, I don't know what that's like. Remember, there was a very, very profound experience that I had, and it was in the early 90s. And this is probably the moment where I held that, that awareness of the difference of my experience being white and the experience of those that are black. And I was at Grace the Cathedral in San Francisco and Bishop Tutu, Desmond Tutu, was visiting and he was speaking and he had really grabbed me. I was a great follower of him and it was a very, it was an honor to be there. But I was standing next to this woman of color and we stood up and we were um, singing a hymn or something. I, I can't remember exactly, but whatever it was, it required that this woman and I share like the booklet. And I remember it was during the summer, so I was somewhat tan. And I remember looking down and our arms were next to each other. And I noticed we were the same color. The tone of our skin was the same color. And yet I knew her experience was so different in the world because her features were black. It was obvious that she was black. And it was obvious that I wasn't. And right about that time, Bishop Tutu was being escorted out. And I looked up and, and I was just so overcome with that disparity that I just started crying. And she handed me a Kleenex and it was just it's like there was no need to even share that difference it wasn't important for me to put words to it but in those in that moment I knew how her life experience was so different than mine and I held that I held that as a precious moment for what two weeks it's like I didn't live with that that was one moment of time in my experience where I was aware of that. I was aware of that white privilege, but I kept living my life accordingly. I mean, I've certainly lived in my heart in a, in a way that I could, but I didn't take that on as a cause. And I think this is a time when we need to move through our shades of grief. We need to move through our denial. We need to move through our panic. We need, as white people, to know it's different for us. And we need, to, we need to be accountable for that. We need to be aware of that. It doesn't do us any good to be guilty about it. It doesn't be, do us any good to hide from it. But we have to start listening. We have to start asking questions and be available. One of the most moving things, I think, for me in this whole pandemic is, is the contrast. And those contrasts are what I tried to put in the, the write-up that I sent out. The, the contrast between 
the riots and the violence and and the protests and the anger and brutality and for every piece of riot that I'd watch, the the you know the flames and the fires and all of that, I'd equally see the reason for it with the brutality of it. It's like, and it was like being on this teeter totter, constantly going from side to side with it. And that's what we have to learn how to manage is how do we keep showing up and how do we make sense of it and how do we experience our own call to action. Very early on, the daughter of a client of mine sent this out and I want to read it because to me it was the voice of, of the generation that's really going to make a difference. And they're the ones that showed up. They're the ones that that crossed the barriers of uh, COVID-19 and said, I don't care about the social distancing. And they went in and they began to gather. And I want to read this because, because it was a call of action and because it was such a young voice and it really framed things for me to begin with. It called me into, okay, what can I do? And I want to read that first and then talk a little bit more. If you live in Minnesota and you haven't posted, donated, made calls, wrote emails, shown outrage or spoken up, this is for you. If you're Christian or spiritual or religious and have living in the grace, light and love in your Insta profile, and I've yet to see your platform to call out your church or friends, if they've remained silent through this spiritual bypassing, this is for you. If you only reacted in outrage after seeing videos of looting and fires, this is for you. If you feel immediately defensive after reading this, this is for you. If you're apolitical and have said, I stay out of politics, this is for you. The list goes on. I have work to do. All white people have work to do. I am so horrifically sorry that we failed George Floyd and so many others, both on and off camera. My heart is broken for his family and the black community that has to witness these horrific murders by police on a weekly basis. Take any action you can today. And then she offered one. And that was so moving to me from, from a voice of that generation. And that's what came out first to 38th in Chicago. And it was, obviously followed by the looters and it was followed by the protesters. But another person, in fact, I think she's on the call, shared with me the other day, she said, you know, we're looking down the, the alleys for, for cars that don't have a license, that are coming here to provoke. And all of that looting and all of that destruction got really commingled with what the protesters were saying, the protesters that had that righteous and rightful anger. And we're calling out the third stage of grief is anger. Anger is truth being spoken. And that's what we started seeing this week is truth being spoken. And then it became spoken in a way that really began to make a difference. And we started hearing leaders of the world come out and speak about what needed to happen. One of the first ones that did it was Jacob Frey, the, the uh, mayor of, of Minneapolis. And what was so kind of interesting to me and is so typical of that bargaining phase of grief, which is where we're trying to make sense of what to do. We're trying to come out of denial, but we're, we're still wanting to stay in denial. And he said, in a very kind of frayed way, he said, you know, I've spent the last 36 hours really struggling with this. And he said, there's protocol after protocol after protocol after protocol in situations like this that you don't speak up. And he said, this is a time when I speak up. And he's gotten a lot of criticism because it took him so long. He's gotten some criticism because of all the mistakes that have been made and there have been mistakes made. But what's different is, that these people are saying mistakes are being made, apologies are being made, people are being accountable in a different way. That's a different shade of grief. And no, it's not enough, but that's what gives me hope is that we're moving in the right direction. 
the, the mayor of Atlanta came on and she spoke so eloquently, Mayor Bottoms, and she said, you're not doing us any favor by coming out and looting. Go home, protect yourself, protest, but do it in a way that the voice can be heard. And that's the third stage of grief. And the fourth stage of grief, the shades of, of despair and that heartlessness where most of us just flatline because we don't know what to do. It's like, that's what's being filled with some of the people stepping forward. But the contrast between those that aren't, it's like the scenes of the policemen still going through the streets. I saw the, the, the footage on, on the Buffalo incident where the policemen are coming down and there was a 74 year old man that was pushed to the ground and nobody stopped to help him. And then the next headline that I saw is 57 police officers quit in protest. And I thought, finally, I've been waiting to see police officers to quit in protest. And then I saw they quit in protest over the two being resigned, or any, not resigning, but being fired. It's like, and I was heartbroken again. It's like, it, I was so hopeful and then it was taken away again. There it is again. You know, that loyalty to that, that brutality and that, that right to use that kind of force. And we have all of it, all of it's there, all of it's there for us. We get hit with one side and we get hit with the other. And the beauty of the, the stages of grief is that we have to be willing to go through our own denial and be in check with it. We have to be willing to look at our own codependency, our own denial, our own bargaining and bargaining with ourselves so that we can get right with ourselves to take action, not from guilt or not from fear, but from outrage and a righteousness and a rightfulness to what's happening here and to show up and to honor. And that's what inspired my husband and I yesterday to go down to 38th in Chicago. And earlier in the week, after I read uh, Molly's thing, I wanted to go down to the protests. And yet there was COVID-19. There was me opening up to bringing clients to my home again. And I didn't feel like I could do that. I didn't want to do two weeks of, of, uh, of quarantine and shut that down again. So I had to figure out other ways to be involved to bring my gifts forward. One of them that I did, and I didn't do enough of this, but I did it, was to have a group where I just let people come on and just talk, just talk about what's going on. And my only requirement was that we tapped. We tapped when people talked and we tapped when people were listening. Because the one thing that we do need to do is learn how to navigate through the feelings so that we keep bringing them back to a window of tolerance so that we don't go outside of that area where we start reacting in ways that are destructive, in ways that become part of the problem instead of the solution. And that is such a wobbly line for everybody right now, that we have to be willing to do the work. We just have to be willing to be aware, to show up in whatever way feels right to us. And so we went down there yesterday, and one of the things I want to share with you is just a few pictures that we took, and they were pictures that touched me because the, the, the pictures that I've seen of 38th and, and Chicago have mostly been with people gathered there. So I didn't see everything that was on the ground, and that's what I want to show this, this um, video of, not, it's a, it's a, really just a, a, a slideshow, but when I was working on it yesterday and I had all these slides together and I woke up this morning and I said, this is a two day seminar. This isn't a 20 minute talk, you know, and there's so much to be said about this and so many angles to come at this with. But I wanna share this with you, but I wanna share a couple of things before I do that. And two things that have really helped me this week has been my tapping. And last time I was here, I talked about tapping and we did tapping with response to the COVID-19 and how, how do we find our place on that human chain of healing and how do we find our place on that continuum and where were we in terms of 
being close to the epicenter. And I'm closer to the epicenter now. I'm not there. I've got clients that are there. And I know the places that have been burnt down. I'm closer to it than I was with COVID where I wasn't in the hospitals, but I'm still not there. And I wanted to go there yesterday. And I wanted to go where I could go safely. And I could feel what was there. And all week, what I've been doing as a way to help myself show up was I took that video, that nine minute video, and I have watched it over and over and over again. And every time I did, I tapped. And I went through the rage and I went through the tears and I went through all the stages of grief. Every time I watch it, it's not like I get through it. It's not like I don't start out every time in horror, but every time I listen to it, I hear something different. And at first I was just horrified by the picture of it, by the inhumane disparity of the animalistic feeling of, of Derek Chauvin just having his knee to, his, to George's neck. And it was, it was, like capturing an animal. It was just horrific. And I tapped through that. And then I just got locked into to, uh, Derek's look and just that righteous entitlement. And it just, it, I felt like I was looking at evil and Lucifer and just hit with that. And then the victimization. And then I just kept working with it and I kept working with it. And then there were times when I was, I was saying the Ho'oponopono prayer, and I was in, inspired by Dr. Hugh Lin's uh, work with uh, the psychiatric ward, where he just took a, the Hawaiian forgiveness ritual, and he took the files of all of these psychiatric murderers. I mean, they were like, you know, the worst of the worst. And without ever even working with them, he just looked at their files, and he did the forgiveness prayer, not forgiving them, but forgiving his response to them. And how that response kept him from his creator. And he did that over and over and over and over again. And ultimately, he was able to close that whole ward because he healed those patients just by showing up and dealing with not their, their uh, actions, but his own reaction to it. And so I started tapping and looking at that with the Ho'oponopono. And I was still having to deal with the very human side of me. I never ever played that video without having to walk through my human response to it before I ever got to the sole purpose of it. And it's much too early to grab onto the sole purpose, but I started really, really at least flirting with that. Like, what was that contract? When I looked at George and, and Devin, or Derek, I hate to even say his name, what was that contract to hold that? And I remembered when I went to Auschwitz and I walked on that, that you know, land and I, that was the first time I ever opened the Akashic Records and asked Mother Earth, what can I do here? This was in 2003, years after the Holocaust. And I was scared to open it because I didn't know what was gonna come at me. And what Mother Earth said is, there's so much grief here, but everybody that left here had a purpose, had a reason. And that came through with 9-11. And I started seeing glimpses of the soul contract of, the, of Devin and, and, see, I keep wanting to call him Devin, Derek and George to hold that, to bring this to the forefront and George's pleas for mama. And then in the, in the memorial, uh, when Al Sharkin was saying he was calling for mama and they'd all talked about his mother and that vision of her being there just saying, come home, baby, I'm here for you. And welcoming them back. And how many black mothers have had to do that to their children every day? 
and how any of us that are mothers are hold that mother energy. It's like, that's what we're facing now. That's what we have to get in touch with. So we're motivated for change. We can't be complacent, but we can't be stupid. We can't be part of the problem and part of the solution. So we have to find ways to show up and yet manage it so we can take action in a way that's helpful. And that's gonna be different for all of us. We have to find that change within us, but we have to show up for it. I don't know how many of you know tapping. Uh, the short story of tapping is it's a self-administered form of acupressure. Um, and we use tapping on the endpoints. And there's a whole protocol that usually we do even though when we set it up. When I'm doing something like this, I'm just tapping on the endpoints. And what that does is it sends an electrical impulse so that whatever you're feeling there's an impulse that's going and beginning to untie that knot. So what I would do when I watched that video is I would tap, but I also called in my spiritual surgeons and my spiritual tutors and my, the, you know, all my guardians. And I asked them to transmute whatever I was dislodging because I didn't want to send it out to the world. And so what I invite you to do while I bring this up and it, it may have, varying different you know, uh, responses from you. But whatever response you have, whether it expands you or contracts you, if you'll just be tapping, and I think I'm gonna do this so that I'll still be there. So I'm gonna be tapping on the endpoints. You don't have to say anything. Just by tapping, you are moving through whatever emotions you may have. And I really encourage you to do that anytime you watch something provocative. You know, one of the biggest places I have had to watch it and neutralize was when I see Trump and some of the stuff. It's like, and I had to own that the rage I felt towards him, the hate, the, the disgust, was on the same continuum as Derek felt. It was just down here. And I had to neutralize that because that didn't do me any good to hold on to that disgust. I didn't have to approve but I had to at least get neutral enough to not turn away from it. Neutral enough so I could take some action that would make a difference to find that action. It didn't do me any good to get on the bandwagon of hate, of judgment, of criticism. It wasn't gonna take me anywhere in that moment. There's righteous protest, there's righteous anger, there's righteous action, and that's truth being stated. We don't have to be silent. But we have to find our truth and our anger. So tap. I'm going to go over the points just so people know them. They're the eyebrow. Why doesn't everybody that can? Side of the eye. Under the eye. Upper lip and lower lip. Collarbone. Under the arm right under the breast or the ribs, wrist, and top of the head. So before we even went there, 
we uh, we kind of put ourselves in a meditative state. We drank our what I call now my uh, my liquid courage, um, and we went down prepared to see this, to to be where this nine minutes occurred and that horrible picture, and these two men that are holding that mantle now for all of us to have to contend with. And that's just the beginning of that video that I watched over and over and over again, and still have to watch it over and over and over again. And here it is again, the I can't breathe. We just spent, you know, our time in quarantine dealing with the respiratory disease. And here that metaphor is again, the breath of life that's being oppressed and cut off and keeping all of us from making that connection. Be tapping you guys. And here's what I hadn't seen because it was always covered with people, but it was everywhere. It's like all of the notes and all of the boards and all of the people speaking their truth and coming to mourn, not to riot, but to protest and to mourn. It was very, very moving. And then I brought this up from the internet because this is a, a mural that we've seen, but it was so touching to me to see the creation of this and the, the memorial that's been put up just in this two weeks. It's like, it, it's amazing. And it's going to be a place where people can come to remember. It's going to be a place that people can visit and view. It's a reminder. And there it is, the finished. The finished grave. The finished place where people can come. He will be buried in Houston on June 9th, this Tuesday. But that's a private. This is some place where humanity to come, can come. And standing there and looking at all of that and seeing the, the time and energy and passion that went into that. And then here's a picture of the brother standing where his brother took his last breath. And this is what he saw. They took the outline and they painted it in so it's there forever. Reminding all of us, this is where he took his last breath. That was really powerful to stand there and to feel the energy of that. And I loved seeing this. This again spoke to me of the accountability that people there were wearing masks. And yes, they weren't social distancing, but they were aware. And I loved this. We cannot afford to lose you. Please wear your mask properly. Our daughter was down there and she told me this story about how she was sitting there and most everybody had masks. And she said, this family walked in and it was a mother and a father and a couple of children. And it was obvious that they were from out of town because they really didn't know where they were. And they were asking questions, you know, and none of them had masks. And our daughter went up to them and very kindly she said, you know, you're putting all of us at risk by not wearing masks. You're putting all of us at risk by being here without masks. And so I loved that there was that faction that was holding that reality and yet walking over that, you know, finding ways to break that and take that risk. And then this was very powerful. Say their names right up against the broom, all the people that were there. And even when we were there, there were like a handful at 6.30 in the morning that were already there cleaning the space, owning this, claiming it. 
claiming it as a place where respects can be paid. And then this I had not seen. All the names of people who have died. Of blacks who have lost their life. And then this was followed by this. This makeshift cemetery. There were what, honey, you said about 150? Yeah. About 150 makeshift headstones dating all the way from 1973, I think was the youngest, 74. But most of these were in the last, since 2012. Blacks who have lost their lives to police brutality. Very profound. Say their names. And that's the chant. And then this, the chant, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't connect. And if we don't figure ways to connect and, and, and move through this, we're not going to find solutions. A lot of this reminded me, this and the next picture. Both of these reminded me of that honeymoon. I'm going to come out of this now. I work a lot with domestic violence, or I have worked with it, and, and victims of it. And there's always the eruption of the violence and then the honeymoon phase. And when I would see all of these, these you know, people taking a knee, and I was very touched by it. For sure, I was touched by it. But then I thought, is it going to last? Is this the honeymoon? Is this the, I'm bringing you roses so you forgive me? so that two weeks from now, I can slap you down again. And I think that's what the resolution is. That's what standing in the void is. That's why I've heard more and more people say, we've got to remember. I worked with one client that she's at three blocks from 38th and, and Chicago. And she's in a group that we work with. And so we pulled the group together and we, tapped and talked. And one of the things that she said is, I don't want to forget this. I don't want to forget it next week. I don't want to forget it next month. I don't want to forget it next year. And she talked about how scary it was to be in her house and to have to deal with, with you know, the fear of the riots coming and how isolated she felt. And we were all supporting her. And she said, don't feel sorry for me. There's no other place I'd want to be. And that's how each of us has to kind of find where our place is on a continuum. Where do you want to be on this? Where do you want to weigh in? And use everything you can, but don't move away from any one of those stages of grief because each one of them is what we need to confront. The denial, the bargaining, the anger, the void, standing in the disparity of it, all of the things that I don't have time to go into, all of those contrasts, find the balance for yourself and be part of the solution. And thanks, thanks for showing up today and thanks for giving me this opportunity because once Brian asked me to do this, it helped me begin to structure the multitude of feelings that I had and still have. And find your ways to, to neutralize it, to neutralize it into action, not to whitewash it, not to go back into spiritual complacency or emotional denial, but to neutralize it and make it manageable so that you can find your action, your inspired action, and your way to your creator. And that's it. That's all I can say.